Um, so thank you for the opportunity to come and participate in this. Uh, I knew that if I, oh, sorry. I knew that if I came here, that there was a danger that I would learn something. And I'm happy to say that I was willing to take that risk. And it has turned out to be very much the case. The first day already and today have certainly been very illuminating. And I've enjoyed it as well as learning a lot from it. And I expect to continue over the rest of today and tomorrow and sharing that with you. So I want to take a very different tack. Not that I have anything against the, the natural science, having spent a lot of time doing fundamental research at National Institutes of Standards and Technology and at Stanford. Um, but I've also spent, in my middle career, I've had three careers. The first was doing natural science. The second was uh, falling victim to the ills of Silicon Valley, which is you have to start a company. Um, it's just in the water supply or who knows. Um, and then the third was that that raised questions that I felt I needed to understand social science in order to begin to probe those questions. So I embarked on a third career and uh, became professor of sociology and did various things. Anyway, um, let's see. I guess this presumably will go. So, yeah. So let me start with some questions and maybe first a, nor a normative assertion that, and we've already talked about this, so I don't need to spend much time, but we're living in the Anthropocene era. We're in the midst of the great acceleration, as Will Stefan puts it, and the, the changing, the patterns of un unsustainability is both essential, I would say almost existential, and urgent. So how can this kind of collective behavior change occur? That's really my fundamental question. Because it's not just about do you take your garbage and separate it. It's a question of how communities, at whatever scale one would like to talk about them, handle the kinds of fundamental changes in behavior as a community, as a collective, whether on a global, a regional, a national, a local village, whatever scale you'd like. Not only how do they change, but how do we make them coherent so they are not competing with each other and canceling, if you will. So the questions that I'd like to address are, can social movements for sustainable futures with justice and equity be catalyzed? And I use the term, by the way, sustainable futures in preference to sustainable development because development has some funny consequences in the way people understand that in some cases, and sustainability certainly so. So, uh, okay, I mean, I can wordsmith this a little bit, but maybe you get the point. Um, so then what are the drivers and the hindrances of transformation to sustainable futures? What insights do narrative expressions of vision and identity provide in moving towards sustainable futures? So I'll talk more about what I mean by narrative expressions a little bit later. And how can these, how could we, for example, as the end, I'd like to just briefly, if I have time, get to the question of how can narrative driven role playing games help move towards sustainability by helping people grasp the consequences of living in the midst of a complex system, indeed a complex system of systems. So we already know this. We're there. How do we get out? We don't. We go forward. We can talk about planetary boundaries. I won't spend time on this. We all know about this. We've discussed it. We've just heard two talks which talk about it. But Will Steffen's uh, segregation, if you will, of these two sets of hockey stick acceleration, so-called, um, are illustrative in the sense that on one side are the Earth system trends, on the other side are the social economic trends. And they all have that kind of pattern in slightly different form, but one sees the recent, very recent, acceleration. And 
That is to say that we're facing something that is not only existential, crucial, vital, whatever you like, but it's also very rapid and it's accelerating. So it's not only happening rapidly, but we, it's very hard to catch up when something is accelerating and we're moving very slowly. What I like very much, and uh, she's really a remarkable thinker, Kate Rayworth, um, she came up with this donut, I would really call it an annulus, but that's okay, donut works much better, and she's written a wonderful book about uh, donut economics. Um, and the point there is that yes, we have the planetary boundaries, which are very useful for thinking about our condition, but what I kept arguing with Johan Rookström and others since 2008, basically when they're working on the first paper, yes, I get it, we have limitations, we have boundaries in that sense, so what are you gonna do about it? We said, well, we have to change. Yes, how? And that's my question. How do we make that change? And what Kate has done with this donut, I don't know if, it, if the parts are really visible, it doesn't matter. The outside are these hard limitations, if you will, that have to do with the physical conditions, physical materials on Earth the planetary boundaries, so-called, from ocean acidification, ozone layer depletion, land conversion, freshwater withdrawal, et cetera, climate change. And the inside has to do with the social foundations and the fact that we operate within this physical environment, but we have all of these issues that lead to, for example, inequity in, in income distribution, access to energy, social benefic benefits, etc. So how do we stay in this safe and just space for humanity is another way to look at this whole thing. And of course we have the sustainable development goals which are a major accomplishment in actually coming to such a comprehensive set. On the other hand, they're also a very complex set because they are deeply interconnected and interdependent. And therefore, they cannot be, in a sense, addressed simply by the kind of reductionist science that we have been used to performing and teaching. Um, so th there is also perhaps a question here too, at what scale does this make sense? And how do different cultures, different conditions affect this? I often point out to people, I mean, I have been working for a number of years in the Arctic until recently, didn't have time, but working with, with communities in Naryanmar in, in Nenetsk Okrug in the Western Siberia, and working with uh, people in the Kibere slum in Nairobi, outside Nairobi, um, sustainable future might look quite different. So how do these translate into those different conditions and cultures is a difficult but absolutely essential point to consider. So let me just summarize that by saying science is inextricably, inextricably embedded in the natural systems on which it is entirely dependent. And sometimes when you talk to people about, you know, ecology and, and sustainability, oh yes, there's a very nice forest about three kilometers out. I say, wait a minute, no, I mean, what are you breathing? What are you drinking? What are you wearing? Oh, you mean we're in the middle of this? Yes, we are in the middle of it. Sci but what's also important is societies define what's relevant and valuable in their relationship to the local and global environment, including ecology, biodiversity, and resources. It isn't a given in some sense. Sustainability depends on how people conceive of their relationship, and therefore, very crucially, the terms agency and responsibility arise. So what is your responsibility? What is your agency? What are you capable 
of doing. Maybe as importantly, what do you think you're capable of doing? So for well-being and survival, I would say, in this case of really rapid, indeed accelerating change, it means that societies must continually learn and innovate for societal needs. We can't keep doing it the same way. We don't have a playbook. We don't have a textbook that says, oh, you just do this and we're fine. Well, we don't have it. And yes, we know how to do this in a sense in doing physics, let's say, and we know how to do it in biology. We can do it in a number of fields. How do we do this for society? That's a really tough one. And it means, that I use the term co-design processes. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, and ultimately, I think the question is, how do we change behaviors, patterns of behaviors, and again, collective, that rather than focusing on how to fix what we've screwed up and we continue to screw up, let's get ahead of the curve and figure out how not to walk into the next trap. Um, very briefly, I started this uh, as part of the International Human Dimensions Program in Global Environmental Change about 12 years ago. Um, and I, it's knowledge, learning, and societal change. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I now call it Classic Hub, though I'm sorry I misspelled it intentionally. Um, but the point is to understand collective behavior change and to use that to catalyze ways, movement, along pathways to sustainable futures in different cultures with equity and justice. So let me iterate this slightly and, and expand it. So it's about this learning, innovation, negotiation, navigation. And the pathways, though, have these difficult aspects with them. There is an inescapable uncertainty, not because we do bad science or we don't know what the hell we're doing, no. It's because it's fundamental to a complex system, including that one cannot necessarily assign causality. We're used to saying, okay, this happened because that happened, and we know the relation. Most of, in many cases, people don't distinguish cause and correlation anyway, so it gets confusing. But more importantly, in this case, we simply can't, in a truly complex system and a complex system of systems, know for sure that we understand the fundamental causality. Second, there is a normative ambiguity due to the fact that there are multiple value systems, beliefs. The way one views this is a social definition, as I mentioned, and as the result is there are unanticipated, unintended consequences that come back and bite you later. Maybe tomorrow, maybe 10 years from now, but it, w it may well because we do not know all of the loops and interconnections and causalities. So very briefly, I mentioned the idea of co-design. And so very briefly to show, I don't know how much how visible that is. Uh, one example is in the Arctic Circle, we're talking with rights holders and stakeholders in the, dial, in the Arctic. The other is just recently, I was working with communities who are dealing with earthquake recovery in a small town near uh, Kumamoto in Kyushu, southern Japan. And again, it's not about giving them solutions. It's about evoking the information in a form that they can work with and use in their context to make their decisions about how to move forward to a, their own sustainable future. Very briefly, and I'm not gonna go through this, this is a schema that I developed that we've been using now at the Institute for Advanced uh, Sustainability Studies in Potsdam um, that just goes through how to engage with the stakeholders and rights holders and shareholders. And the key point here, which often gets missed, is, uh, let's see, that that will show up. 
key point here is interpretation of data. Data doesn't speak to us. Here we are in the Hall of Musicology. You get a piece of paper with some lines on it and a bunch of dots and maybe some other symbols. Well, you can take an instrument and start playing each note. Not very interesting. <laughs> What's interesting is the interpretation, is how you play that, how you make sense of it. And that is equally true of what science does. We have data, we make a story out of it, we try to make sense of it, but we don't all agree as to what that story really means and how we do that. So that interpretation with the stakeholders and rights holders is absolutely essential in my view. So a little bit about data, computation, and narratives. There are many uh, efforts. We've got a, a plethora of, of integrated assessment models and uh, trajectories that are being done. I'm involved in one project called The World in 2050 that IASA in Vienna, not IASS, but IIASA, um, and the Stockholm Resilience Center are, have been putting together over the last couple of years. And yes, there are these integrated assessment model. You're looking at trajectories from today through 2030, the SDGs, to maybe 2050 and beyond. Great. Uh, there's a problem here. What if society changes rapidly? And you say, here's my starting point. Um, oops, we have a problem. So we, when we first brought this up, Sander van der Leeu and I in particular at the first meeting about two years ago, actually the second meeting, um, the modelers said, oh, no, no, you know, we don't do that. Well, they've changed their story. And in the report that was issued in July of this year at the UN, um, in the high-level political forum, the second chapter of that report, which was authored by Sander and a bunch of us, um, Sander van der Leer is a former dean of the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University, is now a senior fellow at my institute and also still at ASU, um, really call attention to the fact that we really have to understand the social dynamics in order to have any clue how to look at the large integrated assessment process. So you need to understand the social dynamics, and that, in my view, leads to the question of narratives for critical qualitative insights as a basis for what I call provocative modeling. We're not predicting. We can't. We're not doing system dynamics, where you start out, you know what the system description looks like, and you can project it out. Great, fine. Can't do that for people. We're too messy. Um, it doesn't work. So how could we use this? And basically the idea is that the computation allows us with big data to do these kind of critical distinctions and nuances, not only statistical averages, if you will. And so we're looking at visions, narratives of vision and identity and I'll get a little more. Um, so you have, by the way, by narrative expression, I use that rather than narratives as discourse, can be discourse, but most people don't know the whole very beautiful, very powerful speech that King gave, but they do know the phrase, I have a dream. People don't know, in this case, the children in this village in Taiwan, don't know the whole story of their village and the loss of it due to a typhoon and mudslide, but the artist has created the narrative in painting. Picasso did Guernica on a wall in 1937 that changed the way people thought about war, millions of people, with that painting. So it's not just about a string of words. It's about music, it's about dance, but there's also, unfortunately, the other side of the story. Um, and I'm sorry, a little misspelling there. Um, 
because it grates on my nerves. Um, but the incredible thing is, believe it or not, this campaign to outlaw sustainability was successful in two states in the United States. They passed a law outlawing sustainability in two of the states, and Kansas in particular, which has been suffering a drought for 35 years now and is an agricultural state. You think, are these people totally nuts? No, and it's dangerous to think that way. The point is they, have a, they were operating with a very different narrative. Their narrative that drove their decisions in that sense was about freedom and the idea, I mean, here's a woman jumping up with a house because you can have your own house instead of having to live in large common quarters. You have this guy jumping up under this car. You can drive your own car. You don't have to use public transportation and a bicycle. I never figured out what the kid and the teddy bear were, but okay. Um, <laughs> Whatever you want. Um, but the point is, these are very powerful. And the point is, we need, in terms of the science, we need to pay attention to the emotional content of that. If we don't, we cannot communicate around this. And we're stuck. And we cannot be. So going from that, we did an analysis uh, just in a symposium in Taipei, end of, uh, of September, beginning of October and looked at associative plausibility of narratives, the framing of the narrative, the normative affirm affirmation, does it fit my normative framework? We looked at the, uh, how does it emotionally identify or, or catalyze emotional response, and the emotional drivers for action, motivational incentives. This, these come from both the motivation, I, I'm sorry, the vision, so where do we want to go, how do we express that as a narrative, and on the other hand, very critically, and what has been often overlooked is again the identity. I mean, it comes up in people's discussion of identity politics. Well, why is that important? Because it's motivational. It's what tells me I should act that way because everybody around me with, with whom I am bound acts that way. It's a very interesting example that Dan Kahan at Yale pulled up from, thanks, um, from studying farmers in Kentucky in a rural area, relatively good farming country, and they're all very right-wing, red-blooded, Republican adherents, okay? Well, he goes and asks them about climate change. Oh, no, 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 absolutely not. Okay, fine, goes away, comes back, and goes with them out on the field, wants to see their fields. Okay, while he's at it, he says, well, how are things going? Boy, things are changing so fast. We're not making much money anymore. We have trouble with this. Well, the story is, they identify with their community. They have to, because this is small communities, they're linked to their community. They're dependent on it, codependent on it. So if I say, oh yes, climate change, yeah, um, human induced, well, <laughs> you're quickly kicked out of the community, if you will. You can't rely on your neighbors for support, which in this kind of a, Livelihood is essential. So these kinds of identity issues play a real role in how people make decisions. Let me shift a bit then, given that as a background, I could say much more about it from the work we did, but um, to talking about narratives and learning. And the real point is that one, I think ultimately, to follow on this and to build on this, we need to shift education. And education is simply the infrastructure of our formal part of learning. It is not what we do. We do a hell of a lot more learning outside of the formal structure than we do inside, we hope. Um, so one is that we fail to teach that we are, think we are learning from models, always. 
I mean, when we teach physics, we don't talk about the model. We say this is the result. I mean, yes, at graduate level you do, but very often undergraduate, don't even mention it. And yet, even very young children, I could give you lots of examples, do really well at trying to come up with models. They don't know that that's what they are, but they are. And then the question is, what do you do with that model? We talked yesterday about, yesterday about falsification. Well, you test it. You try to break your model. If you can't, me, maybe it's OK for a while. Let's try it. Want to focus much more on the questions, on inquiry, and on experience. I think of the experiences, and I will show you. I brought a toy along, and maybe at lunch or something, we can all play with it. Um, it's about building a vocabulary for thinking. And it's that experience that becomes the basis, whether not the words that we often teach kids, and they're really good at picking them up, but that's what they use to game the system. I remember sitting in the, in the um, department office at Stanford one day, and one of my colleagues, quite famous and very excellent scientist, not a very good teacher, but a good scientist, um, complained about his students and that his graduate students in the lab just weren't doing great last couple of years, whatever. And I said, well, how did you pick them? He said, oh, they were the best students. They had fantastic grade. They had great recommendations. I said, yeah, I think that's your problem. <laughs> they know how to game the system. They don't necessarily know how to ask the questions. And if you're going to do innovative research, you better think about how the questions get formed. Otherwise, it's not getting you very far. The idea of looking for multiple solutions, not the answer at the end of the chapter. Um, to go through process with collaboration and with diverse learning styles, with people who think differently, not people who have been acclimatized, <laughs> coerced, whatever, into thinking the same way. And obviously, take the risks, intellectual risks, emotional risks, to try the hell out of something that you think is interesting. And if it doesn't work, fine. You know, in Silicon Valley, the story was if you haven't started, if you've started on only one company and it failed and you haven't done it again, you've failed. If you've tried it again, you're doing fine. And some work, some don't. So very briefly, again, the idea of stimulating questions, nurturing curiosity, supporting the ownership of ideas in a population, improve the tools for thinking both individually and collaboratively, stimulate opportunities for creative idea ideation with diverse groups of people who are thinking about it, who see it differently. And that goes in all kinds of areas. And I think digital experiences can help with empathy, but also physical ones. I've done, I've basically invented a couple of hundred devices in 230 museums around the world, used by tens of millions of people. That's great. The question is, what's the ultimate impact? And if nothing else, what I hope is it makes them look at the way they see the world in a different way. They begin to see their other ways to think about what's around them. And I think to be able to experiment with complex systems is important. I'll talk a little bit about, very briefly, in the last minute or two that I have. Do I? OK. OK, I'll make it quick. Um, I've been very interested in the idea, and I already in the 90s designed a game called Stranded on Mars, which later became <laughs> essentially the basis. I mean, the, the same idea came up in a movie called The Martian. This is a little different, but same idea. Um, one thing was something called Gaming the Future that I did a couple of years ago in Rome with uh, a couple of colleagues. And it's what I, it sounds oxymoronic, but I call it a simple way to understand complexity. Not to understand it in detail, but to understand the consequences of complexity. So, oops, well, let me, 
one idea is that one thing that I did a few years ago before I get to the gaming the future, uh, we did a truck that ran that's run around Germany now. I think that they told me that now some 700,000 people have been through this truck, which I designed the exhibits around the inside of the truck. And in the middle is a game in which you have to use energy in your virtual house. And there are six people playing, uh, and basically like iPads. And you have to keep doing your laundry, the dishes, get food, put in the freezer, whatever. Very simple, really boring, except for one little problem. All of the energy, when you start out, you say, oh, how much energy would you like to be renewable and how much coal? Oh, we're going to be really you know, forward thinking. We want 80% renewable, 20% coal. OK, great. So you start playing for about four minutes, which is a weak cycle in this system. Problem is that all the energy is supplied by two people with hand cranks. And guess what happens when you don't coordinate? You can't turn the crank. And you get a blackout. And people are kind of looking, what happened? And then you stop. And then you have a useful discussion. And then you can play it again, but with giving people clues as to when you're doing your laundry, whatever. So you begin a coordination exercise. But people don't forget that. We have data for that. And lastly, I'll mention the uh, gaming the future, which is a simple way of looking at complexity. You have a Lego board. This is a project that was uh, funded by the Templeton Foundation and Lego Foundation. You have a Lego board, and you say, build a, a landscape. And you can do it anywhere you want. And you can do it. And you know everybody knows how to use the Lego blocks. Very simple, except that there is and this is, it's probably a little hard to see, but the idea was that you can see the consequence of what you've done. So you can see the air pollution, the CO2 output, the traffic density, the uh, river flow, the river pollution. And when you make what seems like a very simple move, I'm going to build an extra apartment building because I need more workers in my factory. That has a consequence. And normally, you wouldn't see it. There's a very brief note here, which is the Legos matter because they are physical devices that people know how to use. So the augmented reality, in that sense, works better because everybody sees what everybody's doing. And we interact. Originally, we started this project to understand social mediation of creativity. But it's turned into this. And I won't go into the big game that I'm starting to develop now at Arizona State. But I think that will do. And is this the end? You might hope so. But it's not quite. We're only in the initial steps towards a sustainable future. Thank you. <laughs>